All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We're excited to have you here with us on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. For the first time ever, I believe, in the history of the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium, we're actually going to take you into our, our night skies, or we're, I should say, we're not going to take you into the Lyman Spitzer Junior Planetarium, but we, of course, miss being able to take you there. And so we're going to show you tonight's skies, the show that we normally run at the museum, and give you a great education on what you'll find when you step out into your backyard tonight to look at your own night sky. I'm very fortunate to have with me today Bobby Farley's Rubio, our excellent planetarium and science, science educator. And I just wanted to take a second to welcome everybody who's joined us in Zoom, who maybe has joined us on YouTube live stream, or who might view this later on Kingdom Access Television or one of our cable affiliates in this state of Vermont. Um, quick few notes for you. If you are in our Zoom meeting, you can definitely ask questions of Bobby today. You can do so by scrolling to the bottom of your screen where, you're, where you will see a Q&A button. And in there, you can type your questions and I'll ask them verbally. And hopefully, Bobby will answer them live today. If we get a lot of questions, make sure you read in there too, because we'll try to answer a few of them in written form as well. To the right of that button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can also see a little chat button. And I see that most of you guys have found that already but you can definitely chat with Bobby and I in there. And if he has any questions for you, that's a good place to put an answer. For those of you joining us on YouTube or on cable access television, you can of course feel free at any time before, during or after one of our classes to email me your questions and we'll get them answered. If not right then, then in our very next class. And my email for that is dbush at fairbanksmuseum.org. So feel free to shoot me an email. And just one note, of course, we are recording today's class, so just be aware of that when you choose to interact today, that this would be posted to our website. So without further ado, I want to welcome you to learning about tonight's skies and to our educator, Bobby Farley's Rubio. So I'll let Bobby take it away. Well, thank you, Drew. Yes, uh, it's funny to talk about the night sky on such a sunny day, but uh, I noticed in the uh, chat that already somebody posted that tonight is going to be a full moon. It is a full moon, and it is a moon that is sometimes called the pink moon. No, it is not going to turn the color pink. In fact, this is a funny thing about a flower called the pink. In fact, I'm going to share with you a picture from the Wikipedia page for the flower that we know in Vermont as Deptford pink or grass pink. It is a beautiful little flower that opens very early in the spring, especially in places like Europe where that naming convention comes from. So we have these here in Vermont, but they don't quite open now. They'll be opening a little later in the moon, so to speak. So sorry for the corny joke, but that's why it's called the pink moon, not because it's going to look pink. And just like with blue moons, these colors on moons are sometimes confusing, uh, but sometimes it has nothing to do with color. But in this case, it has to do with a flower that's blooming at this time. But I want to move on to that program called Stellarium. And if you haven't downloaded this, this is a free program I recommend for everyone. It's called Stellarium, and it's on the website stellarium.org. And that's the program that I'm using to simulate our planetarium. So here we are now in Stellarium, where you can see the grass and the trees are a little ahead of where we really are right now. But that's not why I'm using this. I want to talk about what's going to be happening after sunset. So if you look carefully, you can see on the bottom of the screen the date and the time. That's going to become important as I'm going to advance time, and we're going to be playing around with the concept of time a little bit today. So let's see a beautiful sunset. I hope your internet connection is well enough, uh, you know, steady that you can see that sun is going down, and we're really close to the spring equinox. So the sun sets almost exactly in the west at this time of year, a little bit north of west. After the sun sets, have you noticed it yet? Have you seen it out in the sky for weeks? There's a little light that will be shining bright before any of the real stars do. And uh, you might even be tempted to say something like, starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. But you'd be wasting your wishes because this is not a star. And it also saddens me to say that for many people, this gets reported as a UFO. Whenever this object is visible in the sky, there are increases in UFO reports to air traffic controllers and Air Force bases. Why? Because people don't realize that this thing is supposed to be there. Well, 
I hope you now know that it is supposed to be there. This is nothing mysterious. It's something our ancient ancestors have been enjoying in the sky for thousands of years. It is another world. It is the planet Venus. So Venus is our close neighbor in the solar system. Of all the planets, it's closest to us. And Venus is also closer to the sun than we are. So it might make sense that Venus reflects a lot of light onto us, and that is what creates this bright effect. And because Venus has a tendency to stick out during the evenings, it was in ancient times in English called the evening star. But if you know the orbit of Venus, you might not be surprised to find out that for other times in its orbit, Venus was known as the morning star. And in many cultures, they didn't realize that this bright evening star and the bright morning star were actually the same object because there's a, a day, a period of several days where you can't see Venus at all when it goes behind or in front of the sun. And that is when it becomes mysterious and invisible to us. But right now, there's no mystery about how to find Venus. Go outside as soon as the sun goes down, look in the Western direction, and then you will see Venus without any trouble at all. But let me advance time just a little more. And I want you to notice something very special is happening right now. I'm going to take this out of the way. So if you go out a little later, not right after sunset, but maybe say an hour later, you will see that Venus will be accompanied by something that's very distinctive. And I'm going to let that happen as I answer the question. I see that Drew is telling me we've got a question out there. Yeah. So one person's asking, does Venus move? Aha. You asked the question of the day. Because yes, Venus is a planet, which means that it is orbiting the sun just like we are. And this is something that you don't have to read in a book or just take my word for it. You're going to be able to see this if you go out and watch Venus over the next few nights. Well, look at the time in our planetarium. It says that it's about 8 o'clock, and that's when the twilight starts to fade. Do you notice something funny next to Venus? Let's wait a little bit longer until it gets a little darker. All right, now it's about 8.30, a little before that. This right here, many of you who are stargazers will recognize it right away. This is what a lot of Americans call the Seven Sisters. If you go and look at the Greek books or the official constellation names, you'll see that this thing is often listed as the Pleiades, which are a group of nymphs from Greek mythology. But in Vermont and a lot of New England, most of us might be most familiar with the Japanese name for that group of stars, because in Japan, that cluster is called Subaru. And if you live around here, you've probably seen a lot of Subarus. And that's the little star logo that is on that car company's cars. So if I look at Venus, I'm going to zoom in a little bit with Stellarium, which is easy to do. Then you can see that the Pleiades cluster is right here. There are a lot of stars in the Pleiades cluster. There's six or seven that you can see with the naked eye. And then with a telescope, you can see over 600. Here I've highlighted the entire cluster. You can see the name Pleiades, Seven Sisters, Subaru. This is actually a lot of stars closely bundled together. They are formed from the remains of one giant star that exploded millions of years ago. And that star's remains are being recycled into a family of 600 stars that are literally descended from the same parent star. So you see what I'm saying? They actually are sisters. A way this name really fits this cluster, an open cluster. If you have a telescope, you should definitely point it, point it at the Pleiades cluster. So let me zoom back out to show you the relationship with Venus. Okay, so there's Pleiades, there's Venus, and this is what it's gonna look like tonight, but on Stellarium, you can change time. You can time travel. And I'm gonna pull up the clock here and you can see the date and the time here. Don't worry about Julian Day. We're gonna, that's another, that'd be a whole another class altogether. Let's just stick with normal time and date. And I'm gonna go back a few nights, not tonight, but on April 3rd. There's April 6th, there's April 5th, there's April 4th. And look what happened on April 3rd, Venus, was right in the middle of the Seven Sisters family. There's the planet. Now, of course, I've got to be clear. Venus is trillions of miles closer to us than the Seven Sisters. But it was in the same direction, right in the foreground, right in front of that little cluster. And that is a very big deal to some ancient cultures, particularly the Mayans. The ancient Mayans of Mexico, they observed Venus's 
schedule Venus's orbit more accurately than any other ancient civilization. And they noticed that Venus would do this little rendezvous, this little conjunction with the Pleiades cluster. They, this would only happen once every eight years, but almost exactly eight years apart. It's a really cool thing because of the relationship between the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of Venus, that this happens every eight years. So next year, it will not happen again. Venus will be close to the Subaru cluster, but it won't pass in front of it until 2028. So I'm sorry that you missed it. I know all of us missed it because on April 3rd, it was actually really cloudy that night. So uh, no one in the Northeast Kingdom or in this region was able to see this, but you can probably still enjoy this because it's still sort of going on. Let's go on to tonight. So if that was April 3rd, look at what happened by April 4th. <laughs> Venus had moved just a little bit. And I wanna give you the context. This is a bright star over here called Aldebaran. That's the brightest star of Taurus the bull. And I could talk about the constellation too, but just keep that as a reference point. Look at Aldebaran and look at the Pleiades and notice how Venus will be moving seemingly from one towards the other. And that's the fourth we're looking at, but let's look at the fifth. And then last night, the sixth. And if you go out tonight on the seventh, this is how far apart Venus and the Subaru cluster will be. So if you've ever wondered about how planets move, this is how humans figured it out. Watching bright planets like Venus, Venus is one of the best to see because it's so bright and it moves a good amount every single night. And the ancient Greeks noticed this and every other culture noticed this and the Greeks gave it a word that we still use today. The word planet comes from a Greek word for traveler, hobo, vagabond. So think of Venus as a hitchhiker going across the sky and that'll give you an idea. Let's see what the question is, Drew. Yeah, one person, or I guess two people are asking, why does Venus look bigger the later it gets? So like as you're going through time, I would assume they're saying. Ah, uh, well, part of it is because of the fact that we are not using the real sky. We're using a simulation. And on a computer screen, in order to make something get brighter as the sky gets darker, they have to make it look like it takes up more pixels. So uh, let's just say that that is not, actually a real effect that's a digital artifact of the fact that we're trying to stimulate the sky with stellarium however i want to show you something really cool that you can do with stellarium i'm going to take the uh, calendar out of the sky for a second here and zoom in on venus because if you zoom in all the way you get a very accurate reproduction of what venus would look like in a really good telescope so check it out it looks like a half venus it looks like the first quarter moon. Um, and that's because Venus is in between us and the sun. So as Venus is uh, moving around the sun, we get to see different proportions of the light and dark side, the night side and the day side. And it was observations of this that allowed Galileo to basically prove with this telescope that Venus was going around the sun and not going around the earth. So in a way, Venus has unlocked a lot of the secrets of the solar system at different times in history. For the ancient Mayans, it helped them figure out their calendar system. And in the time of Galileo in 1609, 1610, he was able to use it to uh, set up a solar system where the sun is at the center. And then he could convince everyone with the evidence in his telescope. So Venus is a really cool place. Well, I shouldn't say cool. It's actually a really hot place. Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system. And even in this image, you can see one of the reasons why Venus has a thick layer of clouds that traps the heat from the sun. So the light can get into the air, but then the clouds trap it like a big blanket. And because of that thick atmosphere, 90 times more air than Earth has, clouds made out of thick layers of sulfuric acid. Venus is 900 degrees Fahrenheit day or night. So be glad you're looking at it from a distance. Drew, what's the question? Yeah, so <clears throat> one person's asking that, you know, we have the moon, of course, orbiting Earth, but they're wondering, does Venus have moons and or do other planets have moons like ours? We're very lucky to have the moon that we do, and I feel bad that I've neglected the moon because after all, we've been talking about Venus, which is going to be on the western side of the sky. But if you were out at the same time, you would be seeing the full moon. I know it looks small. That's partly because a digital rendering always makes the moon look smaller than it looks like in our imagination, the moon looks this big. 
but that is the full pink moon rising tonight. And the moon is actually really huge compared to the size of our planet when we look at other planets in the solar system. We have one moon, Venus has zero moons, Mercury has zero moons, but Mars has two. But Mars's moons, Phobos and Deimos, are really tiny compared to our moon. They're a few miles across, whereas our moon is 2,000 miles across. So actually, if you want to understand the size of our moon, a real easy way to think about it is it's about the same size as Australia, or the same size as if you, uh, you know, put one end of the moon on New York City, the other end of the moon would be close to Las Vegas. So it's almost as wide as the United States, which makes it pretty big relative to the size of our planet for the other moons that we see in the solar system. Jupiter has over 100 moons. Just 75 of them have been named. And Jupiter is huge, though. It's 1,300 times bigger than the Earth. So it has a lot more gravity and a lot more pull with the moons. What's the other question, Drew? Oh, um, well, they're just wondering when you're talking about moons, why aren't they just called the two moons then? You mean the ones around uh, Jup I mean, Mars, Phobos and Deimos? Yeah, Phobos and Deimos. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, FOMO, uh, it, it, Mars, which won't be visible until the early morning hours, so I wasn't going to talk much about Mars, but Mars is two moons, uh, are named after characters from Roman mythology. If you know Mars is the god of war for the ancient Romans, they got the idea from the ancient Greeks who called them Aris, or Ares, as some people pronounce it. Well, in the Greek and Roman mythology, the god of war has two sons. They are fear, which in Latin is phobos, like phobia, if you have a phobia. You're afraid of stuff. Phobos is fear, and Deimos is terror. So it's a pretty dramatic thing. The sons of war are fear and terror. That kind of makes sense. And that's why they kept the, that theme when they came to naming the moons of Mars. But the moons of Mars look more like baked potatoes than like fierce warriors, just if you're worried. They're very small. They're pro probably captured asteroids. Our moon, if you haven't heard the news, the most likely... Uh, uh, hypothesis for where our moon comes from is that it's actually debris that broke off of the earth a long time ago more than four and a half billion years ago when the earth was just forming and just young so perhaps the reason why we have this huge moon is because of this cosmic accident that left us with this beautiful night light that you'll see rising full tonight so let me uh, move up a little bit back to what we were talking about before that's where the moon is going to be look at rising in the east and you have over here venus near the west setting at the same time so as venus lowers in the sky and i can do that by speeding up time you'll see that venus will be sinking towards the horizon and if i zoom out a little bit you might be able to see them both at the same time and the moon will be rising on the opposite side of the sky but remember it's not these things that are moving as much as is our planet going wee spinning this way. So this is one way to see it. The horizon looks a little weird with uh, Stellarium, but uh, don't let that fool you. You're not at the bottom of a well like you can do if you accidentally. Oh no, I fell in the hole. So have fun with this program, folks, if you download it. You can use it to see what's going to happen in the sky over a long period of time. But hold on a second. We're about to lose our sight of Venus because I've actually kept us up to almost 10 p.m. So notice how things have changed. You can't see the Subaru cluster anymore. So let me just go back a little bit to a time when most of our participants will likely be out. Here's around 8.30 now. And just for context, I want to show you that Venus is actually in a constellation called Taurus the Bull. And this is where some of you may debate with me. I have a way of seeing Taurus the Bull that's not in the same as it's seen in the uh, constellation guidebooks. But in my imagination, the Subaru cluster is the tip of one of the horns of the bull. And there's the other horn. And here's his forehead. And there's his big nose, his two nostrils. And the red star Aldebaran, Although in some people's imagination, they see it as his eye. I see it as the tongue of the bull. Blah. So if you imagine that snout right there with a red tongue lolling out of the mouth, 
Here's the eyes of the bull and its forehead. And here are the horns where Subaru is one of the horns. And you can see that Venus looks like it's hanging on one of the horns, like it got stuck there. Or it's a fly buzzing around the bull's head. So however you want to see it, that's Taurus where it is. And of course, Taurus is always right next to the great hunter, Orion, a constellation that we are about to say goodbye to because by next month, Orion is not going to be visible in our sky anymore. So if you've enjoyed seeing this big hunter, he'll return again during the hunting season in the fall. But you're not going to see him during the summer months. And in case you don't see him already, let me just show you that Orion has Beetlejuice for his right armpit and Bellatrix for his left shoulder. And his bright knee is Rigel. And over here is the star Saif. Those are the four bright stars that make Orion's torso and right in the middle are the three stars that make the famous belt of Orion Al Nitak, Al Nilam, and Mintaka. So you don't need to know those names. I bet you already knew about Orion's belt. And then you could see that there looks like there's a dagger hanging from the belt, his knife or his sword. But if you look out from where his left shoulder is, here's his other shoulder, here's his head, you can see that he's holding a bow in his left arm. And his right arm looks like it's above his head because he just released an arrow. Pew. Oops. Whoa. I wish I could make my mouse cursor face the right direction. But you can imagine. It looks like he's shooting into the ground with his bow and arrow. And that's the way I like to see Orion, the great hunter, somebody that will be right next to Taurus the bull and Venus, where the Subaru Venus dance party is still going on. And you can watch this. So... This last thing I want to talk about with Venus is a little cool thing that I want you to remember that Venus is going to be moving a lot. So this is tonight. Uh, we're talking about April 7th. But in case you're watching this video a few days later, I wanted to show you that I'm going to advance one day at a time. Well, actually, I'm, let me put up the calendar so you can see what date I'm advancing through. And I'm going to make Venus keep jumping one day at a time, one night at a time, and see what happens. Still drifting away from the Subaru cluster. It's flying towards the forehead of the bull, towards the other horn. And soon, by the end of the month, can you see what's going to happen? You won't be able to see Subaru anymore because it'll be lost in the glare of the evening twilight. And then, oh, the moon? What are you doing over here? I thought you were on the opposite side of the sky. Well, remember, now it's April 25th. That's when we're going to be getting a waxing crescent moon and it's going to be doing a little dance. So look at it this way. And during the month of April, Venus is going to be trading dance partners. It's going to be hanging out with Subaru for part of the month, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. And then by the end of the month, you'll see the moon hang out. And this is what will happen on April 26th. The moon and Venus will be side by side. So this is a cool thing to use Venus for. Let Venus highlight other things in the sky for you because Venus is so easy to find. So Drew, what's the question? Yeah, well, I think this is just a question in general. I don't know if we have time for it all today, but uh, one person asking, did Taurus the bull fight with Orion? And do they <laughs> do a dance around each other or some other <laughs> relationship? There? Oh, well, let me, let me jump back to the seventh tonight and put things in the way they're going to be in our sky. Oops, sorry, I jumped a few days into the past. Here, now we're here at this night. And I want to show you, there's a little thing about Taurus and Orion that's not about him fighting it. Just so you know, there is an ancient Greek myth about Orion doing deadly battle with the scorpion. And Scorpius is a constellation that we're going to see during the summer. Orion is one that we see during the winter. So if you understand the sky, Orion and Scorpius are on opposite sides. So there is a story about how they try to avoid each other in the sky. But this one is not so much mythological as it is uh, one that... There is a story of Orion having a crush on the seven sisters. So Zeus put a big bull in his way to stop him from reaching the beautiful maidens or the nymphs of the seven sisters. I don't know if that's really a Greek mythological story or if that's just one of those mnemonic devices that astronomers and teachers like me use to help people remember this. So remember, Orion looks like he's chasing the seven sisters, but he's got a big bull in his path that's going to uh, slow him down. So... That is the real story. It's not so much a story as it is a little device that helps you remember how to find these objects in the sky. And astronomy is a subject with a lot to memorize, a lot to remember. So this is why we always rely on these somewhat corny little stories like 
Orion chasing the seven sisters. But maybe for my last thing, I want to show you. Oh, another question. Go ahead, Drew. Yeah. So um, maybe a last question as we wrap up here. How, how do you, and this is a Stellarium question, how do you fast forward to see what planets and stars will look like or where they will be? So it's in okay. that calendar. There's two ways to do it. If you go to the bottom and hover over the bottom border of the screen, you'll see these little fast forward icons. There's a button that looks like a triangle pointing down, and that means to go to right now. So if I hit that, it would show the sun in the sky. I don't want to do that. But if you go to fast forward and, and all that, you can go really fast. So like a year is a second long. Uh, you may want to turn off the ground and atmosphere and fog settings. Uh, so the quick way to do it is hit FGA and you turn off all those things. And then you could fast forward and see the sun and the stars at the same time. F for fog, which is on the horizon, G for ground, and A for atmosphere. If you take off the atmosphere, you don't have daylight. You don't have blue skies. You have stars and sun at the same time, like if you were an astronaut on the moon. And I bet the kids out there who are using this program can explore other ways to use it. You can fast forward through time. You can lock onto a planet and watch it going around the sun over time. You could, maybe we'll do some of these things together, but uh, I think this program is a little bit like a game in that you could use it to explore the, the mechanics of the solar system and have a lot of fun at the same time, but it, know that this is a very accurate program. So everything it shows you will be accurate uh, so that you can expect to see it in, at night if you see it in this program beforehand. So. Uh, well, as we're wrapping up, I know we're almost out of time. I just wanted to give you a taste of some ancient astronomy to understand why people thought they could do fortune telling with the stars and the movements of planets like Venus. As a matter of fact, in Stellarium, you can uh, bring up different views in the sky like this line right here. This is the horoscope line, the zodiac line. And notice that Venus is a little bit above that line, right, relative to Orion. And let me show you a little diagram from a different program. This is actually from an old astronomy textbook that I have. Let me show you what would happen if you did a long-term plot of Venus. If you look on this picture, you can see the top one says evening star and morning star. When Venus is on the left side, it would be visible in the evenings as it is now. And when it's on the right side, it would be visible in the mornings like it will be later on this year. But notice that the movement of Venus, as I showed you, it's shifting one side, you know, from place to place. It creates these really cool loops over time. If you were an astronomer or in old, old days, an astrologer, and you were plotting the course of Venus around the zodiac, you would notice an amazing pattern. Let me show you the next picture. Over the course of an eight year period, if you follow Venus, do you see that dotted line that makes a circle near the center? That's the ecliptic, that's the zodiac line I was talking about. When Venus is above that line, it's closer to the center. When it's below that line, it's closer to the edge of the circle. And if you were to be an astronomer, if you notice the dates, it says 161, 163, 166. Those are January of 1961, January of 1962, and so on and so forth. So. This is based on observations made in the 20th century, but this pattern still holds true through all centuries. So if you do this plot and you watch Venus go around the zodiac, see how it shifts from one place to another, it goes above the zodiac and below the zodiac, it makes those loop-de-loops. Look at what pattern you get after a period of at least seven or eight years, you will make this clear. And if you were an astrologer, you might've thought this was some kind of a sacred symbol. In fact, that five-pointed star is associated with the goddess Venus of ancient Mediterranean cultures. So maybe I, I always used to think it was the starfish that they saw in the ocean since Aphrodite or Venus was born in the ocean. I thought that that's why that symbol was associated with her. But maybe the reason why people associate that five-pointed star with the goddess Venus is because the Venus in the sky literally draws that five-pointed star if you're willing to watch for eight years. I know it seems crazy, but you don't have to wait eight years if you use Stellarium. You can fast forward and see this happen just before your eyes in a few minutes. So we're lucky we have these computers, we have these simulators that allow us to do what would have taken thousands of years to do in just a few seconds in the comfort of our own home. We don't even have to bundle up and go outside and worry about the clouds covering the stars. 
But if it is clear tonight, and this is my wish for all of you, if it is a clear night, as the sky seems to be pretty clear now, I hope you go out there and see Venus. It's worth it. And just think about what's going on and just look for the seven sisters and see if you can notice the distance changing over the next few nights. And then you will connect yourself to all of our ancient ancestors that wondered and marveled at this beautiful bright light that right now we can call the evening star. But remember, it's a planet. All right. So thank you, everybody, who tuned in. I think we're going to wrap it up now, unless there's any last questions. Thank you, Drew, for posting the link to Stellarium. And maybe next time we do this, I, some of you will be pros at running that program. So if any of you uh, give us suggestions, find out cool tricks, maybe you could figure out a way to record a web video or, I mean, a, you know, a desktop video of yourself using Stellarium. I know that you can do that on most computers. So record a video of something cool that you've seen and submit it to us and maybe we'll talk about it next time so yeah that'd be great and you could submit those to dbush at fairbanksmuseum.org that's that email i gave you at the beginning um and you know just a warm thank you to everybody who joined us we know that perhaps folks out there miss visiting our lyman spitzer jr planetarium and we plan to offer these public planetarium shows these what's up tonight sky shows on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. So you can join us anytime and learn how to step out in your backyard and, and look for the things that Bobby has been talking about. And so a warm thank you to Bobby for teaching this first online ever class on <laughs> What's Up Tonight, Skies. And uh, also a warm thank you to all of you who joined us on YouTube Live, on Zoom, or on Kingdom Access Television or elsewhere in the state on your cable access television. We look forward to having you join us again and find all of our programs at fairbanksmuseum.org. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Bye. You, thanks, everyone.